Yeah. We will start the meeting now, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, Vishal. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, can you bring in the first slides from Sadia? Welcome, everybody. Good evening to all of you. I'm your... Uh, today, Rahul has made me the host for this uh, program. Thank you, thank sir. You, thank you, Rahul, for that. Uh, we start with this thing. This program is supported by Serbia. Vishal, can you enlarge? Can you put on the full screen? Yes, yes. sir. So, can you see my screen? Yes. So, it's an international pharmaceutical company and works on a no-profit, uh, no-loss basis. And Servier in India is known as Serdia Pharmaceuticals and they are very good friends. Serdia supports brands produced in India. There are no Chinese active pharmaceutical ingredients and uh, they are supporting all the healthcare professionals and supply chain of pharmacies. And whatever work we are doing, a new thing which is known as a Facebook page of Vimu has come up and more than 38,000 viewers have come and I request all of you to upload on Vimo Facebook, whatever little presentation you have, which is of interest to general public. So uh, now we move on to the, to the meeting. So I welcome everybody once again. And the first of all, I, I have the pleasure of introducing a, a person who does not need any introduction, but introduction, but uh, it's my job to do it. And that is our beloved president, President Dr. Roy Vargis, the president of the Venus Association of India. Uh, today, we on our international platform, we have two friends from overseas. I would request first our president, Dr. Roy Vargis, to give their brief introduction and a welcome note to them. Thank you, Dr. Dicky Wadia. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you, wherever in the world you are. It gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to today's meeting. I thank Serdia Pharmaceuticals, known internationally as Servier, for supporting this meeting, academic meeting. Thank you, Serdia. We have Professor Ayman from Cairo University, Egypt, and Professor Ashkat Sharipo from Almaty University, Kazakhstan. Both of you, them, are the good friends of not only VAI, they are great academics and never misses an opportunity to teach. And I welcome both of you, sir, on behalf of the VAI and our country for finding time in these difficult times to be with us. They have been wonderfully informed of our activities by taking part in our meetings every year and every now and then. I welcome you both, sir, to our particular meeting, this meeting. I now request Professor Devendra Dikivadia, senior VI member, to convene the meeting and uh, we have two chairpersons, Professor Ayman Fakri and uh, Professor uh, Sharipo, who will be conducting the meeting as chairpersons. In case there is a net breakage, one of us will cover for that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Roy. Uh, it gives me again great pleasure of introduce, to introduce our uh, speaker and case presenter today. Our main speaker is uh, Deepak Selvaraj. Everybody knows him well. He is the head of the Department of Vascular Surgery at the Christian Medical College of Ellore, and he is the current secretary of the Venus Association of India and chairman of Purchase Committee of CMC Velour. He has worked at the York Hospital England as a trainee and registrar in vascular surgery. Deepak, welcome, and we are eager to hear things from you, but let me introduce the person who's going to present the case, and that is a well-known again, Nihar Ranjan Pradhan. He is, he is DNB in vascular surgery, and is a senior consultant and vascular and endovascular surgeon at the Apollo Hospital, uh, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. The third person, our first panelist I would like to introduce is Pranay Pawar, he's a vascular and endovascular surgeon and an assistant professor at the Christian Medical College, Ludhiana, and his keen interest is in the venous diseases. 
Thank you Dr. very much, sir. Yeah, Dr. Piyush Choudhury has been a part of us from Chandigarh, and he is the live wire between Rahul and so many people, all the VI members, a young bubbling person, a vascular surgeon associated with the Fortis Hospital Dra at, uh, with Rahul in Chandigarh. Sir, I, he will just join up. He's just finishing the surgery because one That's of okay. us... Okay, but yeah, yeah, no problem. But uh, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, Piyush. Thank you. Thank you sir. And uh, yeah, and uh, our beloved uh, Professor Dr. Ayman and Dr. Askat has been introduced by Roy. And I think I don't need an introduction because I am one of the old men having dyed my hair and, you know, one more Dekhiwadiya sitting beside, behind you. So, <laughs> uh, that's it. And uh, now over to uh, Vishal, you take over, mute others' mics and I, I invite uh, Deepak Selvaraj to start his talk and I request the chairpersons to conduct the meeting further. Over to the chairpersons and invite inviting Deepak. Sure, sir. So, Dr. Deepak, can you share your screen, please? Yeah, I think it's already being shared. Sir. Yeah, I think Vishal, Vishal should come in. Vishal, you bring in because you have got all the all the data with you. Yes, sir. But I think uh, he can also share. Like, uh, yeah, I've, 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 uh, the screen is on. Okay, good evening. Uh, 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 sir, uh, one second. Uh, let me mute everyone and then you can start. You have message. to click on the mic icon so that you can speak. So, Deepak, sir, <clears throat> just click on the mic icon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Yes, you can okay. start. Um, good evening, uh, one and all respected uh, uh, President of the Venus Association of India and the sponsors, uh, Serdia, and all the senior members of uh, the Venus Association of India, especially our international uh, members, Arman and Akshat. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet, uh, look at, uh, see all of you. I think this uh, COVID virus has done some good, at least it is helping us to meet very often. Now, my today's uh, topic is on uh, endovenous laser ablation. I've been given 20 minutes, and uh, Nihar is also uh, going to show us a case. So, without wasting much time, I'm going to go on to my presentation. Um, there are, uh, a, the way we have planned this presentation is, uh, I'm going to take, talk to you about a little bit about the technical aspects and show you some pictures, and Nihar will take you through actually a case, a video of a case, so, so that the, uh, all the viewers will know why we are doing these things, uh, the technical aspects of endovenous laser ablation. And I also bring greetings from Piston Medical College, Vellore, and uh, I'm going to start my presentation. Okay, as you all know, the endovenous laser ablation is a less invasive alternative to venous stripping, and uh, we can uh, laser the great subcutaneous vein, small subcutaneous vein, or perforators, and we can kind of laser almost all the veins that are possible. And this is a fantastic modality that has kind of completely changed the way we look at varicose veins, treat varicose veins. It's kind of made us all very popular. So, now, when we started the varicose veins, we had the uh, laser ablation of the varicose veins. We had uh, these, uh, our knowledge of the physics of uh, laser was very little, and we had to depend on the industry to provide us with various wavelengths of uh, uh, laser material generators and uh, stuff. So, we started with something around 700, 800 watts of laser, and now we're going to around 1,900 watts of laser. So, how, do, how does this actually help? In, treating the veins. Actually, uh, most of the retrospective studies and the meta-analysis have kind of shown that regardless of the wavelength, the ablation of the reflexing saphenous veins is more than 90%. So the wavelengths do matter, but they don't matter so much. So a little bit about the mechanism of these lasers. As we all know, the laser is a 
is light. So light, we pass a fiber which emits light and this light kind of tra tra uh, travels um, through the blood and reaches the vein wall and the light energy is converted to heat energy and it ablates the vein wall. So this is a grossly a picture which kind of shows you how it works. But how, what is the mechanism by which these things work? So there is something called the optical thermal response. So the laser power, the light is incident on the tissue and then it goes and hits the tissue and then it spreads along the vein wall and the vein, the tissue also absorbs this light energy. And after it absorbs the light energy, Um, Michelle, my, my computer is not moving. Uh, sir, can you click on the screen, uh, this slide? Can you click over there? Okay. Yeah. So, so the, the tissue, the once the light energy, which is in the form of photons, hits the tissue, and then it dis dissipates around the tissue, and the, the tissue actually absorbs the light energy. The light energy is converted to heat, and this actually increases the temperature. And the, another thing that happens there is the tip of the laser fiber, you know, the, have you seen the cautery? And it becomes burned, so it, the black stuff that comes from the tip of your cautery, the same thing happens here as well. The blood, that it forms a carbonized layer of blood forms on the tip of the uh, laser fiber because of the heat generated. So the blood close to the tip, it absorbs all the uh, light energy, it heats up and coagulates and denatures and forms the carbonized layer of black uh, suit-like stuff which surrounds the tip of the laser fiber. And the temperature here at the tip can be very high. And so what happens if the tip of the laser fiber becomes hot, the laser fiber tip can come into direct contact with the vein wall. Or what can happen is the heat kind of conducts through the blood and the water in the blood, because of the heat, becomes steam. It bubbles and it forms the heat pipe principle. It's a very interesting principle. I want everybody to listen carefully. So the water forms the bubble. In the, in the water in the blood forms a bubble, like a steam, and it actually travels forward and then it kind of condenses. Around two centimeters, it can travel forward. This two centimeters is very important because I'll tell you when we actually do the uh, ablation, there is an important aspect that I will tell you. Now the heat will heat the blood and the bubbles that form, because the water forms bubbles, they travel two centimeters, then they cool down and condense. And when they do that, they once again generate heat. There's a transfer of energy. Sometimes, and this, and there's another aspect to it. So this energy, the heat, will go on to the vein wall as well. And sometimes the tip can directly come in contact with the vein wall as well. So there are several, uh, uh, several mechanisms that take place here. So, so these, all these mechanisms together generate a lot of heat. So this, is, this slide exactly shows you what I was talking about. The carbonized laser and the bubbles, they grow, detach and travel to about two centimeters. And then they, there is transfers or transfer of heat even more. And this can generate temperatures around 100 degrees centigrade. Imagine if 100 degrees temperature of heat touches the rain wall, what will happen? And this is a pictorial representation of what I was talking about. And this in general is the heat pipe principle. So there are three ways in which you can, you can actually, the heat is generated. One is direct contact of the tip with the vein wall. And then there's uh, condensation or steam bubble formation and convection and transfer of heat energy into the vein wall. And more importantly, very importantly here is something called the pullback velocity. If you pull, pull back your laser fiber very fast, there is not enough time for the heat to act on the vein wall. And if you pull it back too slow, 
there is going to be another problem as well because the vein wall might stick on to the to the vessel and the high temperature that is generated might actually perforate the vein wall so you need an ideal full back velocity now these are some of the laser uh, wavelengths that came initially sorry we started with around 810 nanometers of wave, uh, wavelength and then now we are at around 1470 that is what we use but i think some 1980 is also available now as you see initially when it started there is a lower wavelength there was more absorption by hemoglobin but now what is happening is the water in the blood that is around 60 percent of your blood is water and that actually gets absorbs all the heat and there's water in the vein wall as well and that also absorbs these wavelengths higher wavelengths get absorbed by these and the heat is generated and the bubbles are generated so it's no longer hemoglobin but it's water as well but clinically it doesn't make much of a difference as i told you all the wavelengths actually give you good vessel closure so that's what i meant wavelengths are equally efficacious but echinoses and pain is significantly less as we go up with the wavelengths now this is a uh, example of a bare fiber. We started when the industry came in first, we started with bare fibers, and now we've progressively moved on to covered fibers. And what we use, I will show you later on, is a radial fiber, which means that the tip of the fiber is no longer bare, but there is a concentric radial ring around it, and the fiber doesn't come in touch with the vessel wall directly. So, the important players in laser ablation, I want you all to listen very carefully, is the tip of the fiber. The volume of the blood, why is that? Because the laser light, the photon, has to travel through this blood and it has to reach the vein wall. So if you want more of the energy to, re to reach the vein wall, then the volume of the blood that it's in contact with should be less. And the vein diameter is also very important, as you know. The larger the vein diameter, the more the, the volume of blood, and the effect of uh, convection and uh, transfer of uh, heat, the light energy into heat is very less, is lesser. And there's obviously fluence and wattage, which is actually, fluence is actually, wattage is the power of the laser and fluence is the amount of joules that we give. And these are, these are all very, um, um, these are physics, I won't really go too much into it. And most, another most important thing is the pullback velocities, like I said, told you, told you. So what do we do? Now radial fibers that we use, you see that picture there, we have a concentric rings around the tip, so there's no longer the bare fibers and they don't come in touch with the wall directly. And we find that this is very, very efficacious and they give us very good results now. And there's less chance of perforation and the results are fantastic. Then volume of blood, that's a Cronenberg question that you put them into before you start the laser. And in this question, all the blood goes back into the vena cava and the vein is more or less empty and uh, the laser fiber is almost in touch with the vein wall. So vein diameter is very important. I'm going to show you a vein chart where, where, where the relationship between vein diameter and the laser amount of joules and the pullback velocity is uh, uh, will be shown. This is the chart that we use. So if a vein has say 7 mm vein diameter, then we use around 8 watts of energy, of power to, and our pullback time will be around 1 millimeter per second. And that will give, we'll have a lead that is a it's around 80 joules per second. So this, we use this chart, it's a very important chart that is based on a very scientific chart, which we use to show according to the vein wall, the uh, size of the vein diameter, we can change the power and the pullback velocities. And that, if you follow this chart, you will get the best results. So, so that's what we use. We use two kinds of machines. And uh, this is one machine where we can actually change the settings up to 30 watts, you can change the settings. According to this chart, we can change the settings. It depends on the uh, diameter of the vein wall, we can change the uh, number of the watts 
and uh, we can adjust the settings so that we can have a pullback time will give us the be best results. And this one is a portable uh, um, uh, generator that we use, but it gives only six and eight watts. So we are a bit limited with this, uh, uh, um, this instrument. So, sorry. So now, nowadays we have an average of around 10 to 12 watts. And early when we started our practice, we used to use very high watts, but now it is mostly around this range and we seem to be getting very good results. So this is based on this paper that you can, so journal of endovascular therapy, look into. And we use a 1,470 nanometer laser and the technical success rate is very close to 100%. Uh, and we have some amount of, uh, uh, analgesia uh, post procedure, we need to give them some combi plan sometimes, but most of the times we are all right. And this is the pullback velocity that we use in most of the cases based on the chart that I showed you. It's around 1 to 1.5 millimeters per second. We don't go far the faster than this, or no, we go lesser than this. I'm going to quickly run through because Nihar is going to show you a video how we do it. And we use ultrasound guided uh, cannulation. Uh, using the Seldinger te technique. It's fairly simple. I'm sure all of you are doing it. Um, there are two techniques on how you can cannulate the transverse technique or the longitudinal technique. And uh, we make a small incision with a beaver blade and insert the cannula. And then that is followed by a wire. You see a, you see a seven, French, seven, M, seven French cannula and a wire. And then we insert the laser fiber. And uh, everything is done under visual radiological guidance so that we know what we're doing. Normally we access it below the knee. That's a very nice and easy place to access because the vein is very subcutaneous here. And uh, but we have to be careful because of the proximity of the saphenous nerve. There is a mild chance of, uh, of um, paresthesia that can develop. But if you are well experienced, you can actually see the nerve as well and avoid it. This is what we use a 18G inside, an O3 by guide wire, six French or sound French sheet, and it is ultrasound guided. And uh, we position the patient, we pass the needle inside, that's how it looks on the transverse uh, uh, picture. And uh, you can actually see as yes, this is a tumor sense, you know. Uh, we give a lot of tumor sense anesthesia, it is actually normal saline with some soda bicarb and lignocaine mixed concoction. I'll show you what it is actually. But this is a, a fairly clever machine which kind of injects the tumor sense. We got this machine from a plastic surgeons and uh, this is very effective because you can connect this machine to a cannula and uh, you see this IV uh, normal saline solution that the concoction that we have, the magic solution. And uh, we penetrate the under ultrasound guidance. We pass into the saphenous fascia and inject the tumor sense here. And, uh, and it's usually cold saline plus lignocaine plus soda biker. This kind of acts as anesthesia as well as it causes compression of the veins so that uh, laser fiber comes in contact with the vein wall. So benefits of tumors and anesthesia is uh, anesthesia and you can actually see the separation. Uh, Nihar will be showing it to you. The separation of vein to be treated from the surrounding structures and uh, uh, it is uh, there are there are a few studies which have compared uh, uh, laser procedures with tumor sense and non-tumor sense procedures. There's some uh, some uh, surgeons who actually believe that you don't need to give tumor sense, but uh, as a protocol um, in our institutions we give tumor sense because our results are good and we just don't want to change the way we practice. And most importantly, you must wear these, pair, these uh, glasses. Uh, these are laser protective glasses and you have to wear them. And uh, I want to show you one picture here, which I've kind of missed out. Uh, um, that is a saphenofemoral junction here. And you have to keep the fiber, the laser fiber has to be kept at least two centimeters beyond the saphenofemoral junction. We usually position it where the first tributary goes off the medial or lateral circumference, whichever is closer. And uh, why we need is two centimeters, because as I told you, when the laser fiber 
um, starts uh, emitting light and light gets converted to heat it will the it will heat up the water in the blood and the steam and the bubbles can travel two centimeters across so we don't want it anything to go beyond the saphenofemoral junction so it is important that you place your laser fiber somewhere there not be very close to the junction and then uh, these are some of the complications that we have. You can have a hematoma, you can have thrombocubitis, you can have hemosis. Uh, these are all with the lower wavelength lasers. As the wavelengths become better, the pain is much better now nowadays. But some people can have tattooing of the skin. Uh, I don't have a picture, but uh, people do enough lasers can actually see the spots, black spots that you can get. You have to be careful of that, warn the patient that there is a possibility of tattooing. So, in uh, conclusion, endovenous laser ablation is an effective method to treat insufficiency and we've got excellent occlusion rates. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, Deepak, that was wonderful. And you gave a very good idea about the entire procedure. Lots of new things to add for us, particularly the trendland position. So I think uh, learning never ends. Now let us see a practical uh, uh, video by Nihar. Nihar, welcome. So, thank you, sir. Namaste to all. So, after, yes, sir. So, after uh, excellent presentation in the detail how laser works uh, by um, our uh, senior vascular surgeon. So, now I'll present on the one case and how we, we, have, we need the diagnosis and management. So after Deepak's presentation, so this one I'll definitely, it will help. Yeah, so this is a 54, 54 year old grocery shop owner, which is uh, by profession, he need to stand for a long time. So, He's in the, in the job for more than 30 years. He's a, an ex-smoker and uh, suffering from diabetes for last 12 years, hypertension 10 years, and both legs, visible veins, and ankle skill discoloration. Uh, there is some, something has happened. Yeah, so both legs, visible veins, and uh, ankle skin discoloration left more than right last seven to eight years. But last six months, he is suffering from a uh, ulcer at, uh, the, at left leg ankle with pain, swelling, and intermittent bleeding from ulcer, and which is unable to stand for long and more leg pain is happening. So, so unable to stand for a long time and more leg pain and heaviness symptoms in the evening, feeling good on walking. So all these uh, points are very important. This patient which is, who is an uh, ex-smoker for more than uh, smoking history of more than 20, 20 to 25 years and diabetes 12 years and hypertension. So whenever we are seeing this patient with this history, we have to be think of the other part also. That means whether this patient's the blood circulation, arterial blood circulation is okay or not. Because many times I am seeing this patient with uh, ulcer that might be diabetic ulcer and might be ischemic ulcer also. So this patient, when we examined, then the, we found all the distal pulses in both legs, dorsal spedis artery and uh, posterior tibial are all nicely palpable and bilateral GSB is dilated and palpable and there is an ulcer of around 2.2 to 2 centimeter size. So 
our general examination said patient was vital were stable and all peripheral pulses palpable left ankle medial side there is around 2 into 2 cm size ulcer and dilated great saphenous vein with sfg reflux so multiple incompetent perforators and both legs plantar sensation in the uh, aspect on the feet are less so more towards peripheral neuropathy is also there so left side in a, uh, as per the cap classification left side was c6 the right side was c4 so my provisional diagnosis was diabetes hypertension peripheral neuropathy both leg varicose vein with left leg venous ulcer so routine blood investigations i found glycosylated hemoglobin was 8.6 and random blood sugar was 270 so and venous doppler reported gross varicosities on the left leg with continuous sfg reflux and multiple large incompetent perforators whereas right leg grade 2 saphenopneural junction reflux and multiple incompetent perforators so as uh, we know the venous system contains around 70% of the total volume of circulatory blood volume and this picture is very important you see the we have to focus for the incompetent perforators many times if the perforator is size is more than 3 mm then the gross uh, reflux in the uh, perforators incompetent perforators are there which we need to be addressed and particularly near the ulcer patient may develop um, uh, the in, in the large incompetent perforators that cause incompetent uh, non healing ulcer at the ankle so here you will see there is a lot of uh, means how the venous return happens you will see here it starts from the uh, capillary pressure and then the muscle pressure in the striated muscle contraction in the calf area and arterial pulse pressure and negative intrathoracic pressure so this is very important uh, that emptying of deep veins during calf muscle contraction so vein filling up occurs when muscle is at rest so for that yeah so when they are, we are working the ascending venous pulse during working movement the calf contraction occurs and venous return starts you can see here this picture when we are lying posture venous pressure is only 10 mm mercury pressure and standing still 90 mm mercury pressure so we know all the varices dilated twisted and elongated veins and which is the patients with chronic venous disease it causes around 50% reduction in quality of life that is very important so for that nowadays at least the public awareness has increased now because if you will see if i'll just look back 20 years back when the patients were coming in the late stage i'd see six stage they were saying sir this uh, dilated veins are um, um, visible but it is not causing me any problem but because previously our working habit was more nowadays to save time our working is less we are all using either two wheelers or four wheelers or uh, sharing autos so even if daily wage workers they are also having venous ulcers because their working habit is very less so so this if you see the what are the symptoms tingling aching or pain sensation of swelling or burning these are very important muscle cramps thrombic the thrombic pain on the calf and heaviness and itching skin may occur and if you see the as per the cap classification c0 when there is no visible signs whereas c6 active venous ulcer there is c2 is varicose vein c3 is when there is presence of edema c4 skin changes like uh, lipodermatosclerosis or pigmentation and c5 is field ulcer so the early stage is up to maximum 3 the late stage is 4 5 and 6 you can see here how the ulcer this is a very small the patients many time comes with very large ulcer 
they used to complain sir i have visited to several uh, doctors but nobody told us so to all our participants my request is whenever you are seeing any patient with ankle ulcer either medial or lateral aspect uh, and patient is having some comorbidities like diabetes or smoking history ask them to stop smoking completely and with sugar blood sugar under control feel their distal pulses if it is palpable then only venous doppler will be sufficient to know the grade of reflux confirm it and go ahead with the further management so as i told so the clinical characteristic of uh, pain will be it will be diffuse leg pain and the leg pain sensation of swelling and sensation of heaviness will come and more it is in the evening and strong emotional effect is there and high impact on quality of life yesterday i was attending one webinar where uh, one senior professor of uh, um, uh, community medicine he was saying the present covid scenario time what is the emotional effect and uh, what is the psychological problem so for that we are getting lot of on on uh, uh, online consultation where majority are emotionally affected because of this lockdown so our job is to do a proper diagnosis though it is difficult uh, over telephonic consultation but where we are suspecting there is the patient might be having the uh, related to varicose vein so ask them to do a venous doppler and visit to your opd so the yes so chronic inflammation is a key component of the chronic venous disease this is early treatment is essential to prevent progression of say, uh, uh, chronic venous disease yes so if you we'll see here the uh, the micromolecular leakage and microhemorrhage causes the lipodermatosclerosis that leads to venous ulcer so usually location in the saphenous femoral junction incompetence it is on the medial side if it is saphenous popliteal junction incompetence it will be on the lateral side so coming to treatment of chronic venous disease we can have a medical therapy followed by surgical or endovenous therapy so today i'll say about my patient what i have done so in the because i found my patient was having glycosylated hemoglobin is very high and random blood sugar was uh, more than 270 to 80 so my plan was to stick blood sugar control and to, i started with blood spectrum antibiotics painkiller and venoactive drugs wound care by daily dressing with hemopyrosin ointment and use of ulcerex stockings followed by two weeks after uh, under proper blood sugar control patient undergone both legs great saphenous vein endovenous laser ablation surgery and left leg with multiple stab ablation of superficial varicose veins and right leg injection foam sclerotherapy uh, that is 1% uh, polydocanal so uh, this venoactive drugs where it acts you can see here it acts on the inflammation so a patient with venous ulcer and all any stage of varicose vein they get very uh, very much a uh, lot of advantage in the anti inflammatory action so that patient symptomatically feels very uh, feels uh, better on the leg pain and swelling also and uh, this patient with venous ulcer Uh, they get when uh, the uh, high dose of venoactive drugs came that is uh, 1000 mg once daily when we started with that the patient symptomatic uh, relief with uh, this inflammatory activity and pain has reduced a lot so then subsequently we have to go ahead with the surgery surgical and uh, surgical intervention either endovenous or open and compression stockings definitely it helps because it will reduce the edema and as well as the inflammation reduce so here this is the not the same patient because i could not find this patient's um, video so as dr deepak told clearly so we need to have ultrasound uh, a good quality ultrasound with the color doctor pro we need to have and along with that one good laser machine Uh, Dr. Deepak showed a very good machine, which is very good one. 
So here, under ultrasound guided, we puncture. You can see here. Yeah. Yeah. Then. So now coming to uh, injection, normal saline tumescence. So Dr. Deepak showed a nice instrument, which is definitely very good. But where if you, we are not having that machine, that still we can uh, give a proper tumescence by injecting normal saline around the great saphenous vein. So what we used to do, we used to take a, a one liter normal saline uh, and uh, uh, we use a three way so that in three way sister gives the injection and on the, on the ultrasound guided uh, the surgeon goes on puncturing the great saphenous vein around the great saphenous vein, not great saphenous vein. So you can see here. So now we have started the firing. You see here how it is. So when you are giving the normal saline injection, see here so nicely. Dr. Sure. Nohar, your time yeah. is getting over. Please wind up in one minute. One minute, yes. sir, please. Yes. Yes, yes. So these are the how you puncture and inject normal saline all around. This is the, uh, so here also is the video showing the advantage of, of laser machine is you can see there is, we can see the direction of uh, the color of the laser, the red color that helps here. That is the advantage of endovenous laser ablation. So, so coming to the different treatment modality already we discussed that the first is varicose veins. If there is superficial venous reflux, we can give only medication and followed by the compression bandage. The, if there is ulcer or more than grade two to three reflux is there, then uh, injection, uh, sclerotherapy, and endovenous laser ablation. So compression bandage is very important, which uh, so we have to apply properly. It has to give a pressure of around 20 to 30 millimeter mercury pressure. That is very important in the post-op care. In the applying uh, application of the compression bandage, it has to be from the morning till night, and then the, during sleeping time, we remove it. So I think, uh, Nihar, you <laughs> must uh, wind up your presentation. Yeah, and, uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I request uh, Dr. Roy, the chairperson, yes, to open the discussion with the panelists and the other chairpersons. Over to Roy. Thank you, Dr. Dickey Audio. And uh, I now invite uh, Professor Ayman and uh, Professor Ashkat to give their. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Roy. Uh, I really enjoyed both presentation and uh, the case presentation it was both of them great. Uh, I think uh, we have to start uh, discussion with the panelists. Uh, I may ask Dr. Power to comment, uh, if he has a comment for either the, the discussion for the presentation or the, for the case. Dr. Power, please. Uh, hello, sir. How are you? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, that was uh, two excellent talks by our two speakers and I think they've uh, almost, I think, spoken about, uh, I think, everything about, uh, you know, EVLT and uh, especially uh, they've spoken about how it works, what are the physics involved and uh, all the other things. So I think it's a very excellent talk by them and I think it's much appreciated. I think if anybody has any doubts, they can write it and we can answer them as per, uh, you know, whoever, whoever you know, would like to talk. Uh, okay, this is great. I saw uh, Soraya Nara raising his hand, her hand. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, you can ask your question. Please, Soraya. Uh, 
Doctor Dickie, what is it? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Doctor Dickie, what is it? I suggest that uh, we will get the opinion from uh, Professor Ashkat and the other panelists, and please select the questions. And uh, sir, we ask. have questions on the chat as well. We can take that. Up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, we invite Ashkat for his comments, and then. we make a, we reply to the chat questions okay ashkat your comments please yes, yes. thank you dr dikivaria very nice to see all my indian lab friends thank you very much for invitation for this brilliant event okay uh, thank you to dr dipak you to doc, for dr nihar for excellent presentations very useful topics for practical uh, working everyday practical working for vascular surgeons and general surgeons who uh, who use this kind of uh, treatment for varicose veins okay should i should i um, okay okay question from dr atul sul uh what level do you recommend for vein access uh, to dr nihar question uh the question from uh, dr atul sul yeah. to dr nihar yes to dr nihar Uh, sorry uh which uh, level of for vein access do you recommend yeah actually i recommend just at the uh, knee level or below knee above the mid calf level above, above the mid calf level do you mean uh, this case or generally in in generally all patients i prefer to puncture the vein above the mid calf level okay uh, do you use uh, ultrasound uh, situation for yeah. yes in in each case personally yeah so ultrasound guided puncture and uh, uh, simultaneously i used to give the normal saline injection all around so that uh, good tumescence so that the diameter of the great saphenous vein comes down as dr deepak told in my practice also uh, i found it is very great if you are giving a proper tumescence so that the skin uh, damage less and the effect of the post laser effect is very good okay thank you yes dr dikiwadi i would suggest please pick up some questions and ask Yeah, and, uh, and I also suggest uh, Professor Ayman to give us comment after the after the main answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Vishal, Sopti, you have all the questions with you. Why don't you start speaking one by one? Okay, sir. Fine. Yeah, that'll be easier, faster. Okay. Yeah, sir. So uh, one question from Veer Shetty. Uh, he's asking. Which one should we manage first, ulcer or varicose vein? Yeah, Doctor Roy, you can answer this. No, I would uh, say very simply, manage the infection. As soon as you got the infection, go for the varicose veins. The ulcer heals faster. Then compression, compression, and compression, and compression and compression five times. Okay, sir. So next one is from General Surgery Ames. rfa uh, versus labor uh, laser ablation yeah i think deepak you can give your comments on this yeah oh, exactly. um, so that's a very good uh, question but um, uh, we do more both of these rfa and laser ablation to be very honest there's hardly any difference between uh, these two procedures um except the cost and uh, we are happy with both the procedures and the results are closure rates are pretty good with both the procedures and pain is also much is the same with both the procedures um, there's hardly any difference between these two procedures 
it uh, depends on what uh, each surgeon uh, likes. Uh, at the moment, we are actually doing a randomized study between the uh, thermal and non-thermal, uh, uh, thermal and non-thermal uh, procedures, uh, MOCA uh, and uh, uh, thermal procedures. So that will be more interesting than comparing two two thermal procedures. Any primary information you can give about thermal and not thermal is MOCA versus laser? Just so, a, a basic you know, review. We're just, uh, we're just doing the midterm analysis because the number of uh, venous cases have actually dropped. So we're kind of doing the midterm analysis. So we have around uh, more than, uh, uh, I think, around 150 patients in each group. And what it actually is showing is the, the recanalization rates are actually higher with the uh, MOCA that is uh, mechanical chemical ablation. But what is interesting is uh, the, the clinical scoring is pretty much the same. And uh, patients are as uh, happy with MOCA as well as with, uh, in, uh, with thermal ablations. And you don't uh, use anesthesia here. And sometimes you use anesthesia. The post-operative pain is much better with MOCA. But the long-term results are still awaited. So, I think that as the two years down the line, you might see that the thermal procedures are much better because the recanalization rates will be much lesser. So we're just waiting to see how the results pan out. Uh, I would like to add to Atul Sule's question that I reason I asked because the video you showed that puncture was at medial malleolus. as well, Atul. I would like to comment uh, of the certain hundreds of lasers we have done. Our aim is to stop firing the laser at mid-calf. Whether you really puncture at mid-calf or you take the vein at medial malleolus is immaterial, but you should stop firing at mid-calf level because then you are very close to the saphenous now. So we, we do use medial malleolus for punctures and we do not see any hyperesthesia or anesthetic patches provided we stop in the mid-calf. Any of our next questions? Yes, sir. So next question is from Nihal Mustafa. And the question is, how long you ask the patient to do compression therapy after EBLA? Uh, can I answer that question? Yeah, Deepak, go ahead. Yes, that is another very interesting question. And uh, we actually started another randomized study, but literature says that um, some amount of uh, um, compression immediately post-operative period is, is actually better in, the, uh, in attaining closure rates. However, uh, most of the, there is not, uh, there's probably one or two randomized studies which have compared these um, compression versus no compression post laser procedures. And uh, there is a group where you, you give them the, uh, the long stretch bandage, but then you don't put them on any class two compression stockings. There's another group where you put them on class two compression stockings and most of the, many of these studies have almost uh, the same closure rates. But once again, mind you, we have not gone down the um, non-compression channel. We have just started another randomized study. At the moment, all our patients have class two compression stockings after a procedure, at least for a month. There is one very interesting question once again. Uh, I think all of you can answer and Roy can additionally comment is that the tumescent which you inject, should it be normal thermic or should it be very cold? If it should be very cold, what temperature you prefer and how do you achieve this temperature? The temperature of the tumescent fluid. Yes, Roy. Uh, this one I personally use a very cold uh, saline and you have seen that and uh, around uh, three to five degrees centigrade because it sends it into a spasm. The volume that uh, is to be injected will be much less. And of course, soda bicarb to diffuse the, and a little bit of lignocaine. And that's all what I do. So the volume to be injected will be much less. Even if you are doing hand injections, not all will be lucky to have a machine like uh, what they have in a CMC Villa. Now, I would like to have the comment from Professor Ayman on what is his technique. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Uh, I enjoyed the, the talk very much. Uh, I, I want to comment for both speakers. 
for uh, Dr. Silvaj and for uh, Dr. Ranjan. Uh, Dr. Silvaj, you made a very great uh, presentation and uh, very illustrative. Uh, but I may uh, have a point for uh, the, the tip of the laser from the saphenothermal junction. I think uh, now it is a, a matter of debate. Uh, using the radial fibers and the double ring fibers enable us to go as close as to the great softness, the, the saphenothermal junction and no fear from injuring the deep veins. Uh, using this cross-sectomy will decrease the length of the stump and will sure minimize uh, the recurrence rate and effectively get a, a better result, especially if we have uh, uh, anterior softness reflux, we can manage both great softness and uh, anterior softness reflux in such a manner, and no fear from uh, injuring uh, the deep vein. Uh, what's your comment for that? Uh, I think uh, Dr. Harinder is the best person to answer this. Yeah, Harry, come in. Hi, everybody. Hello, Professor Ayman. Good to see all okay. of you. Uh, well, it's been an excellent presentation, Deepak and uh, Nihar. And uh, Professor Ayman has raised a very, very valid and uh, very relevant to us today, that is laser prosectomy. And uh, earlier when I started, we were told, don't go near the SFJ, you know, 2.5 centimeter. But now there is a little change in thinking that the closer you, if you can go, but do it very carefully, then you will reduce your incidence of, um, you know, recanalization. So we have been doing, but very, very, selected patients, we go almost to the SFJ and don't withdraw it to the uh, two centimeters away. So that's a new concept, but at the moment, it is not the standard of care. Now, yes, second I... point I would like to make, if I can, is about non-thermal ablations. If uh, Deepak remembers, we had a debate on this. I was for and he was against. And non-thermal, non-thermal, non tumescent have a definite role, especially if it's a very a uh, large thigh, a very obese patient, because there you cannot do a proper uh, compression. Or if it is a patient who has a very low threshold for pain, there you, you know, sometimes you, some people give anesthesia, general anesthesia. So in, you can avoid giving, because there is hardly any pain in non-thermal, non tumescent techniques. So thank you. And I think laser prosectomy is still something which needs to be discussed in more detail. I think uh, the earlier uh, technology, which means the procedure we were using was the Trendelenburg operation. You know, we had used to dissect, ligate, transect all the tributaries, and then we were uh, pulling out the vein with that stripper. So when we do this laser, actually we are avoiding those tributaries, and that could be the cause of secondary varicose veins in these patients. And we have to rethink on the entire procedure because maybe you make a cut of one or two centimeters to like get all these tributaries that would still uh, take us more towards a successful and less recurring uh, uh, type of vehicles when patients address. Uh, uh, let us ask uh, what Deepak feels about this. Would you go for surgery? Sorry, uh, just can you repeat the question? I've been answering all the questions on group chat. <laughs> oh, uh, the old technique original surgical technique was Trendelenburg operation where we used to ligate all the tributaries in the inguinal region and then strip off the vein. Once the advent of laser came and then, you know, we were stopping everything 2.5 centimeters short of the SFJ. But this leaves all the tributaries as they are and there could be a source of secondary varicose veins, particularly towards the lymph nodes, which Professor Wool has very well demonstrated secondary varicose veins coming out of the lymph nodes in the inguinal region. So, what would be your take? We do a small surgical multiple ligation there. What to do? Any any idea, any suggestion on this? This is, you're talking about uh, after we doing, after we do a tunnel bug surgery or? Uh, no, after laser. laser. After laser. Yes. That, level, that will need a cut. But then we are not fighting for a cut or not for a cut. We are fighting to 
maximally treat a disease and avoid recurrence? I think, uh, yes, that's a that's a good question. You you find after you do a laser, you find all these patients coming with the uh, tributaries, which kind of weaken laser and have uh, uh, blood going on both directions. Um, now the thing is to in these patients is to see how symptomatic they are and what are we actually treating. Is it uh, cosmosis or is it ulcer treatment? If it is uh, just just cosmosis or it is patient satisfaction, then you can do less invasive procedures like home therapy or uh, perforator ablation techniques are available, which are uh, less invasive endo, uh, endo, endovascular perforation ablation techniques. But if you are actually uh, treating a venous ulcer and your junction is actually reflexing, then you might have to, um, there are two possibilities. What we do in our center is we kind of, uh, we don't do redo lasers for these patients. We actually take them to the theater and make a small groin incision and uh, kind of uh, completely ablate the subnatural junction and remove all the tubular places. And That's exactly what I was asking. Symptomatic the patient is and what we are actually treating. Anyway, chairpersons, uh, it's yeah. exactly one hour since we started and I, th and I think it's time to call off for this uh, session. Do you agree, Pro uh, Dr. Roy yes, and Dr. Dr. Ayman? We, we conclude the meeting or we continue? Uh, sir, have, have we, we answered all the questions in the chat? Sorry? Have we answered all the questions in the chat? Not all the, but it's one hour is over. So I, I'm supposed to... No, 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 sure, sure. I think that's a good idea. I think w what we can do is, uh, Vishal, if you can just uh, note down all the questions. Yes, sir. And uh, put in all these questions to, uh, to the uh, either the chairperson or the speaker of this session. Okay. And, uh, I have answered most of the questions. Yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Okay. Just uh, I yeah. could see lots of questions. That's, that's, so, a, that, that's a good idea, Rahul. Yeah, if there are some questions left, you can add those questions also at the end of the YouTube uh, video, what you're going to make of the make. Yes. Uh, Raul, one more suggestion I have to make that whenever a case presentation is going on, we should stick to eight minutes and stick to the case presentation. Yes, sir. That will, you know, make actually, our sir, meeting it, more lively. Yeah, sir, actually talking, uh, I think Deepak spoken to Neha because we had the similar problem in the first session also. So that then we corrected it. And uh, I spoke to Deepak Defo yesterday and we discussed that he's going to speak to Nihar so that there is no overlap of the slides. So, and we also have this aim that how this both 20 and eight minutes are useful. They should not be in overlapping each other. Yeah. They should be complementary to each other. And so that people can learn much and much and more and more. But I think um, there was some miscommunication. Nihar didn't got the message well. And uh, that's why the whole overtime went off. So we will make sure next time it doesn't happen, sir. So next we meet next Wednesday. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Hope to see you all again soon. Thank you Thank very you. much for so the much. meeting. Very nice. Pleasure, pleasure meeting you. Thank pleasure, you very pleasure. much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh,